Welcome to ND and Me, a podcast to share NDA's lived experiences. Hi, Ed. How are you? I'm good. Nice to meet you, Richard. Thank you for inviting me for a chat. That's um, nice. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so um, explain to me and, and everybody watching and listening who Ed is. Oh, it's a deep question, isn't it? Well, that's the hour gone, really, isn't it? <laughs> Um, who am I? Um, Ed Dupree. I'm 55. Yes, 55. Um, I got my autism diagnosis when I was 48. Uh, and then about 18 months ago, added dyslexia and dyspraxia to that. And I, all of them collectively have had a profound impact on my life. Um, I live in rural Suffolk, um, uh, married, my wife is autistic, which she didn't find out until three years ago. Um, and we've got a nine-year-old son who got his diagnosis just before Christmas. Um, so we're an autistic family. We think the dog is possibly autistic as well. <laughs> it doesn't go well with change. Maybe, don't know. Um, maybe all dogs are. Although there is an argument, dogs are ADHD and cats are autistic, but we'll leave that one. Um, I didn't academically perform very well at all. I left school with two two O levels um, and stumbled into um, a very junior civil service job, which I didn't like at all, but got stuck there. Um, I'm ancient and old, so when I joined the workforce, there were no computers in offices. There was an inbox and an outbox. We had people delivering mail. And we had a typing pool. Um, it was a very different world. And then one day, they just dumped computers on our desks and said, get on with it. And um, my colleagues who are established and older civil servants really did not like computers. In, in their defence, they didn't get any support, so it's not surprising. Um, but I did. I really enjoyed it. You got a manual. It, uh, it was a paper manual back then. Um, you got to fiddle. You had to. You couldn't just click and away you went. Um, there was configuration required to just install software. Uh, and it was fun. I enjoyed it. Sorry, I'll mute my laptop, otherwise we'll get... Um, All kinds of bings and bobs in the background. We will. Yeah, there you go. Um, muted. Um, and so that led um, to an interest in technology. I had no exposure to computers at school. Um, you had to be in the top set of maths uh, for, to get, get near the ones that we had. No BBC Micros, and I wasn't in the top set of maths. Um, and it led on, and it led on. I did an evening class in uh, basic programming. Um, the civil service had outsourced their IT function then, so I couldn't continue and pursue that. So I took a massive punt. I applied for a HND at um, University of East London. It had just changed from North East London Polytechnic. Didn't think I, I would get accepted, but I did. So I left a very boring and not, not very rewarding job, but one where I got a steady pay packet and became a full-time student. It was a massive risk. I loved it. And I, I loved um, the academia. I, I, I was reasonably well supported, but still undiagnosed at this point with dyslexia, dyspraxia, and autism. I found it hard. I had to work really, really hard, but I enjoyed it. Um, and I did well. I, I, again, this was a new experience for me to actually do well at something. Um, Transferred to the third year of a four-year degree, again, did well. Um, part of that was a, a placement year. Um, so I, I spent a year working for a financial regulator, really enjoyed that. Um, and then went to work for them full-time um, out of the university. And I worked really hard. Um, I, I guess I had to, to keep up, but I enjoyed the work. Um, and this is the, the 90s. And the culture in IT was 
a very long hour culture. Um, and then not surprisingly, I burnt out. I got sick. Um, the only thing I was diagnosed with was glandular fever. But um, I, looking back, it, it was what would be called now chronic fatigue syndrome or ME. And I spent quite a lot of my 30s very ill, very tired with no explanation for for why that was. Um, I think I gradually learned to manage the symptoms. Um, it was a limiting life. Um, I basically worked and rested. That was pretty much it. Um, and it was quite depressing. Um, but I rolled on. I learned to manage it um, in, into my 40s. Uh, continued. Uh, my wife and I were married. Um, my son came along. Um, but I was getting heavier and heavier. I was putting on weight. Um, I had, was gradually collecting um, a list of chronic health conditions that didn't respond to treatment. Um, I was getting <clears throat> more and more depressed, and anxious, and uh, so sort of towards my late forties, I, I had the first of um, two quite serious, I guess you could call them breakdowns. Um, and I took quite a long time off work. Part of the reason was some things that were going on in, in the, in the um, kind of office environment that nobody really liked, um, but they kind of got on with it. But they had a profound impact on me. They they stopped me from doing my job effectively and doing the right thing. It was very important to me, and I couldn't. Um, so while I was off, I, I took the time to kind of reflect on why this was impacting me so much more than you know, everyone else. And um, started to do some research. Um, initially, I thought, oh, well, maybe I'm... Um, highly sensitive person it's a, a term um and yeah in many ways i am um, physically and emotionally um uh, <laughs> clothes are a nightmare it takes me ages to break them in uh, we've had to get rid of whole sets of bedding because it doesn't feel right and no amount of washing will change that um but emotionally, I do. I think I seem to feel things very strongly, um, and things that don't appear to impact other people really impact me. Um, but there seemed to be more to it than that. There was the, the physical sensitivity as well. Um, there were issue issues with um, building friendships and maintaining relationships. Um, issues with sound and noise and uh, bright lights. Um, and, and so gradually, I, I kind of thought, well, this looks like autism, which was a bit of a revelation. I did the online tests that everyone does, and the app scored really highly. <clears throat> um, I'd seen my GP several times uh, about being signed off from work, effectively. Um, went to see him with my big list of things and my test results, and he, he was... Um, supportive but i don't think he thought there was um but he had seen um the impact that, that um things were having on me so he referred me and i, I live in suffolk <clears throat> and we have a fantastic um adult autism diagnosis service here it took a long time it was quicker than it is now um, it took about a year from referral to the diagnosis and um, sitting there for the last session, which was a, a long face to face one with uh, the senior clinical psychologist um, was was really strange to actually be validated and told that no, you, you're not weird. This is a difference, um, particularly after the physical problems I've had in my 30s where nobody could tell me it was wrong. It was definitely implied that you know, I was either making this up or was, you know, mentally there was something wrong with me because nobody could tell me why I was sick all the time, tired all the time, ill. Here was some validation and, and it was 
a strange feeling walking out there, but I felt a lightness. It, it felt like um, a weight being lifted. Um, and it was a bit of a roller coaster after that. Because I thought, wow, this is great. Er everything's clear now. The world's going to accommodate me. <laughs> They're going to understand me now. Um, but no, no, that, that didn't happen. Um, and so I, I had the self-awareness and I, I could be kinder to myself, but the rest of the world, no, there was no change there. And so the same environment at work continued. Um, the same problems I, I was having continued um, until COVID, um, which for many people, majority, I guess, was a very negative time. But it was incredibly positive for me. Uh, I had no idea how damaging the office environment was for me and going in every day, the time commuting. <clears throat> um, being at home was liberating. And without trying, I, I lost nearly nine stone. <clears throat> My chronic hypertension just vanished. I, I had gum disease that just went away psoriasis just disappeared uh, i could sleep you know i'd been an insomniac my whole life but i was sleeping seven or eight hours a night it was incredible um and all just effortless this did i mean i didn't do anything um I, I was just allowed to recover and rest i was still being productive at work um i was still functioning um but it made such a profound difference to my life. It, it was incredible. Um, and now um, I, I, I'm actually uh, sort of two jobs down since then. But the two jobs that I've looked for since since COVID, uh, I have looked for remote work. Um, and that is becoming harder and harder to find, fortunately. But I'm very fortunate I now work for an employer who uh, I, I was open um, about my autism and my needs in, in, during the recruitment process. And that certainly closed quite a, quite a few doors. Um, there were company, people that I got in touch who were incredibly enthusiastic and experienced in my CV. And as soon as I mentioned autism, they just ghosted me. But not who I'm with now. But they were very open that um, it isn't policy for them to have 100% home working so they've accommodated my need to do that and um, it's only been since early August that I've been here but I certainly feel welcome and accepted for who I am which is fantastic uh, so that brings us more or less to, to here yeah. what an introduction um, I, I, I regularly have to I regularly force myself not to go into my life story when somebody asks for an introduction because so many people don't want to um, afford the airtime to listen to stuff. But we are a sum of our parts and sometimes the wider context of you know our journey is more helpful than not sharing more detail. So thanks very much for running us through um you know, t t teenage to today. Um, so, 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 what were the two A levels you passed? O levels. Um, what did I get? Uh, religious education, which okay. I'm an atheist. I'm an atheist now. So, um, <laughs> and English language. Um, they were a C and a B, I think. I can't remember exactly. Uh, but yeah, it wasn't brilliant. I did get a couple of CSEs as well. I can't even remember what what they were in. There. Uh, so yeah, the, it's up to anyone who's uh, going through that themselves. Um, it's it's not the be all and end all. You know, I've got a bachelor's and a master's degree now, um, and professional accreditation from BCS. So yeah, you can you can catch up. <laughs> yeah. Um. So, um, you, your your HND at UEL. Um, yeah. What was the course, and what drove you to go back into education after, you know? the trauma of not necessarily doing so well earlier? <laughs> um, it was H&D uh, and computing. Uh, it, was, it was hard. It, 
uh, the degree was easier. The HND, they assumed no knowledge whatsoever. We were in lectures every single day. Uh, we had a very large demanding sort of raft of coursework. Um, and I, I did it because I, I wanted to continue and learn more and get a job in the tech sector. And I wasn't going to do that um, without some academic qualifications. I never dreamed it would lead to a degree, um, but uh, it, it did. And, and that was a natural progression as well. It, it just, and we were encouraged to do that. So yeah, it, it was, I wanted to work in this field and that was the only way I was going to do that. And most jobs now, you still have some academic uh, requirements, uh, which is bizarre because you don't need them. You know, if you can demonstrate the skills, there's no reason to, to have to have a, a degree. And given how much they cost now, um, it's a real blocker for many people, but that is unfortunately still the way it is. Yeah, welcome to my world. Oh, do you have a bachelor's? No. Well, yeah, and then and then ghosting. But so yeah, I I I I I've been there too. Um. So so you were living in Suffolk and then commuting into the city for work. No, I grew up in um, northeast London. Um, okay. And I lived there till my thirties. Um. So I was commuting into Canary Wharf in the city from there, which sounds quick but it wasn't actually it's, it's a good an hour and a half each way so it's a three hour commute each day um and, and it takes a huge toll you know, and, and that was normal and you know that's just what everyone did so it, it was um exhausting so w w when did you move out into the countryside yeah it was my first redundancy yeah. I, I was working for a company in oh, just down the road from um the old Bailey in central London. Um, this is to, when was it? The first financial crash after 9-11. So like 2007-ish. Um, yeah. Um, and the bottom dropped out of the market, the company operated in. And so that one day we came in, it was on Friday, just before Christmas. <laughs> and um, they said, right, we can, you're going to have a chat with HR and your manager and 30% of you are going to lose your jobs today. And I was one of the 30%. Um, and we were just escorted out of the building. It, it was a shock, really. I'd heard about these things happening. but uh, um, And, of course, we this was illegal, but you you sign away your, um, your legal rights for a settlement, which is more money than you would get if it was just statutory redundancy, uh, which is what I did. And it gave me a bit of breathing space. My partner and I um, weren't tied to where we were, and it, it gave us a, a small bucket of cash that could fund a move. So I looked for work elsewhere, um, found a good job, um, and it was out in Hampshire. <clears throat> and so we moved. Um, it was just uh, uh, adapting to the circumstances that we found ourselves in. And it was a tiny rural village uh, near Winchester that we moved to. So we were living in Dagnum at the time. It was quite a culture shock. But yeah, it was fun. It was interesting. Um, and we've pretty much moved around following work um, since then. Uh, we moved closer to Portsmouth briefly for another job. Um, that one, again, the 2008 financial crash, I think, they shut the Portsmouth office and I was either looking for a new job which at the time was very hard or uh, moving to Cambridge so we moved to Cambridge we couldn't afford to live near Cambridge <laughs> so we kept moving out and out and out and out until we found somewhere we could which ended up being Suffolk um and yeah we're still here we've moved house again but um we, and I love it having grown up in such a Busy, noisy environment. It's wonderful, um, um, but it, just again, it was normal. But it, it, I mean, it was hard to question. Um, but I think that might have been maybe after going back and studying one of the first steps towards acknowledging my difference, maybe, and that I, my needs were different. Because everyone I was surrounded with were fine living in a very urban, busy environment. But um, 
I, I used to hate going back after a holiday. Always dreaded it. I don't know. I, I, I like my holidays. They're fun. But I, I like coming home too. <laughs> so that, that was a new experience for me. <clears throat> um, is, so uh, I, I'm Cambridgeshire born and bred. Um, so um, it, it's surprising that I don't have webbed feet. Um, although my son's feet do look like Hobbit's feet. Um, so yeah, I grew up on the edge of the fens, born in Newmarket, um, lived in Cambridge um, for three years um, as we had our boys. Um, and now we live just to the west of Cambridge in a lovely, leafy, middle-class village in a um, three-bed, semi-detached house. Um, it's it's quite nice. Um, but yeah, it, it's amazing how... <clears throat> Um, London's kind of expanded so everywhere within an hour commute of London is now ridiculously expensive to live because yeah, there's too many people that live in villages like this drive for 20 minutes, get a train 40 minutes later you're in the centre of London and then um, yeah I, I, I feel for anyone wanting to have a nice quiet country life um, living in <laughs> Kent or East Anglia or you know, even you know, Berkshire. Um, so, yeah. Um, so um, your, your office looks like um, a a summer house that you've insulated. <laughs> yeah, that's that's perfect description. Yeah. <laughs> no, um, m mother-in-law decided to um, do the same in her back garden. Um, I'm lucky enough that we've got like a brick extension to the house. So this is the old coal store, but it's like two meters square. So it's pretty big, um, but there's no heating in here. Um, I've got a Dimplex radiator under the desk um, and then I threw an Ethernet cable out in the bedroom window so put some internet in here um, <laughs> and then yeah I, I, I plastered it last summer to make it a little bit more respectable put some laminate flooring in and some insulation and boarding on the roof to stop it freezing it never really yeah. got freezing but you know working in 11 or 12 degrees just isn't nice <laughs> Um. Cool. So, um, what what then led you to getting the dyspraxia and um, dyslexia diagnoses? Oh yeah, that's a good question. Um, it was opportunistic. Uh, the company I worked for at the time partnered with an organisation called Genius Within. Mm -hmm. um, we had a grassroots uh, employee resource group that uh, a colleague and I had set up um, partly because um, I rant a lot <laughs> I ranted at work we had um, bulletin boards and I, I would express my frustrations about um, as an autistic person ab about the issues that I was encountering and the fact that there was no change and as far as I could see, no even will to, to consider change. Um, and, and this was the office environment, um, but it is even basic, simple things like uh, providing an agenda for a meeting in advance, which you think is good business practice, but hey, no, agendas are for wimps. Uh, nobody does that anymore. Um, but it made it such it would make a huge difference to me, taking away the uncertainty and allowing me to to plan uh, and to know even if I could contribute to the meeting because it's a lots of meetings where you realize after five minutes there's absolutely nothing you can contribute. This could have been an email. <laughs> yeah, just exactly. Yeah, okay, indeed. Uh, and even then, it would have been a pointless email. So why are you doing this? Um, and my colleague took notice but bless her she's neurotypical and ally and got in touch and said well why don't we support you know we've got various employee resource groups for minority groups at the company why don't we start one for the neurodivergent um and we did and boy was there a demand for it it was a tech company and there were an awful lot of people who um who, who class themselves as, as neurodivergent um and we gradually built some impetus. Um, the CEO of the company had a personal connection to, to neurodivergence and was incredibly supportive. That's great. And I respect him and 
love that he he supported us. It's also disappointing that that it's often the case. And if you look at um, quite a few you know, organisations that are there to to help, there needs to be a personal connection. It, it, there seems to be a lack of empathy for us, uh, or, or without you, you, someone having a direct connection to someone who's neurodivergent. Um, and he he gave us an ask. He said, "Well, what one thing uh, can we do to help?" And we 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 said, "Well, you need to give us some." We don't do sudden questions. This was in a meeting. Can you give us some time to think? Um, and to his credit, he did. Um, and so we polled. Uh, we we had about two hundred people uh, in the ERG at that time. We polled everyone and said, "What's the one big th- issue?" And it was diagnosis. Um, as I'm sure you know. The waiting lists are just getting longer and longer and longer. Um, it's harder and harder to even get a referral. Um, and so he tasks the people in HR to go out and find a partner, and they found Genius Within, who were brilliant. Um, I've always struggled with spelling. I, I cannot spell. Um, n- numerically, if there are numbers, a the long stream of numbers, um, they move. In, in my vision, I, I just adapt. You know, I can actually hold a ruler up to the screen if it's a, so I can count the numbers. Um, I'm clumsy. Oh, what? Well, I, I don't think. I'm, yeah, that's how, certainly how I'm described. Um, but it was the dyslexia that, that that was an issue. I thought, well, maybe there's something that um, that would help. So I put myself down for a dyslexia um, assessment. Um, I spent quite a long time filling lots of forms. And then quite a long time chatting to one of the fantastic clinical psychologists from Genius Within, who was an ADHD. Um, and I found out I was not only dyslexic, but also dyspraxic. Um, so that's that was the why. Um, I'd like to say it's really helped, but it hasn't. Finding out what things might help and what things are available to help is quite difficult. Um, I've switched all the backgrounds where I can on my monitors to black, so white text against a black background, and that really helps. Um, and, and again, it, it all contributes to tiredness and exhaustion because that really, really, I had no idea how tired my eyes were getting. Um, that made a huge difference, and it's quite minor, but I, I kind of found that out myself. There, there hasn't been a huge, there's not a huge amount out there that, that says, oh, try this, try that. Maybe I just haven't looked hard enough, I don't know. Um, I, I'm with you on that. Um, I, I had a conversation with Access to Work. Um, I want to say recently, but it was like six months ago. <laughs> One of these things that um, you know, you put the paperwork in, then you don't hear anything for six months, and then all of a sudden it's loads and loads and loads of more paperwork to prove that you are actually you know in need. Um, and then um, oh well, we've decided that you need all of this. So that's cool. But you know, I'm self-employed, so I have to put my hand in my own pocket to pay for all of this and then claim it back. Well, I've survived ne- nearly 40 years without all of this stuff. Do I actually need it? And, and some of the stuff I was using the free versions of anyway, so stuff like Grammarly. Um, yeah, you know, I was writing blogs and articles and white papers in my last job. I'm not very good at writing. Um, so having tools like Grammarly were helpful because then it could help me to reword stuff that could be more concise <laughs> and, and and help me with synonym generation so I don't use the same four words again and again and again and again. Um but yeah you know, access to work like oh there's this piece of software which is speech to text so you can dictate to the type. I'm like cool. There's this piece of software that reads to you. So cool. And then there's this Bluetooth headset that you can use whilst you do both of that cool so those three things put together is 1200 quid so i just i'll just use microsoft to read aloud function <laughs> and i'll put up with typing <laughs> yeah i've been mean, typing since i was at school I, I i i type better than i handwrite um so i'll just type um yeah and then this headset um is an old work headset from my last job i've had it since before covid um but it's jabra you know it's well made it 
plugs in so it never runs out of battery um and it just works um you know season one of the podcast um i was on um, an apple like pair of headphones um but they kept scratching because the microphone's like on the cable so every time you move you get a bit of a scratch it's just, it's, yeah. um so I, I it's interesting to me to hear that you found some solace from your autism diagnosis but didn't necessarily feel the same level of um relief with the dyspraxia dyslexia uh, conversation is that more around the accommodations for the latter as the autism diagnosis was kind of like the light bulb moment that explained lots and lots and lots of stuff as the other was yeah i, I do have these challenges i know i have these challenges i think i might have the label for those challenges but what's actually the fix um Anyway, I've just waffled at you without actually a real question. <laughs> no, no, I understand. <laughs> um, I think part of it was the disappointment. Uh, uh, with, I mean, it was life changing. The autism diagnosis and it and it had a profound impact on me. But the disappointment that gradually increased and increased that it made not a jot of difference, pretty much to the rest of the world. Um, so with the dyslexia and, and the dyspraxia, it was, yeah, it was great. I, I know now um, perhaps I can get some accommodations to help with those, but it's not going to change anything in, in terms of how the world interacts with me. Um, I know that now, so um, which is part of the reason I do rant and spout on and, and post about things is to try and change that because this self-interest but it's also my wife and it's my son he's just nine years old so and um, you know it, it'd be great if the world wasn't quite such a hostile and hard place for him to to just exist in um, um, so yeah what i was saying about the the dyslexia uh, nobody knows what dyspraxia is so we'll forget about that one but it appears to be there's this kit so you, you you got the Bluetooth headphones and the two bits of software, but it, oh, it dyslexic. Here you go, boom, job done. <laughs> That's what you need, and it, it's just like, okay. Well, why do I need it, and how do I use it, and how do I get the best out of it? And you know, <laughs> this is what we provide. Off you go. Yeah. I, I, um, so 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 with my access to work, they're like, oh, you can also get um, training and guidance on this. It's two hundred quid an hour. Um, and you, you could reclaim it. And I'm like, there's, there's no way I'm paying somebody to tell me how to use a piece of software out of pocket. You know, if I was employed and the employer was doing it, they could afford to, then that's a different story. But yeah, when yeah. you work for yourself and you're you know, rubbing pennies together, <laughs> the last thing you want to do is drop 200 quid to, for somebody to tell you how to use a piece of software. Um, yeah. But it's but, not so much the, the use. It's we can work that out. Benefit, not, well, yeah. yeah. What, what's the benefit? What what's the kind of bigger picture for it? It's it's you know how does this fit in with everything else? Yeah. And, yeah. and, and, and what's that really cool bit of functionality that isn't easy to find? Yeah. Oh, yeah, by the way, it can also do all of this other stuff, but it's not on the menu. You have to click this sub menu. So, well, I'm never going to use it because it's not right in front. Yeah. Uh, so um, now. What what I like about what you rant about <laughs> um, is that you've you've managed to do it in a way that is less divisive than how I do it. <laughs> and I, so so I, I've been told in no uncertain terms by a number of prominent folk in our space um, that that I'm quite divisive, and I'm like, well, maybe. <laughs> so. Yeah, I'm just wondering if that's just a personal style thing, or um, if you're actually really, really calculated about, you know, the the tone and the words that you use when you um, raise the concerns. I, you. I am quite calculated now. Um, the the ones that I, I've done before on internal um, sort of chat boards have been divisive um, and quite confrontational. Um, because after the diagnosis, I became angrier and angrier 
um, for quite a long time. Partly uh, about why did it take so long? Um, I, I mean, it is really quite obvious that I'm autistic. Um, it's really quite obvious that as a child I was quite different. Um, yeah, there was a lot of anger. <laughs> um, and then as the world did not um, change in, in any way, or even appear to, to be open to even discussing changing, there was a lot of anger uh, around that. And that was focused. Uh, I was quite fortunate, I, I think, that I didn't get sacked on, on some occasions because it, it was confrontational. I think justifiably, um, because nothing was changing. Um, but from a, a, a professional and career perspective, um, it was not good. <laughs> um, so going forward, I am quite calculated. I, I do try not to be divisive. Um, I have regularly deleted things that I was going to post because I just thought, no. Um, and it's more, well, what do I want to achieve? Um, do I want to annoy people? Um, I don't know. Do they need to be annoyed, though? Um, do they need to be shaken up? Because I don't know how you feel about... Um, the environment. that It does appear to be a lot of D, E, and I washing going on, where there, there are lots of wonderful words and um, sentiments that then don't actually translate to to a, a change. It, it's it's PR, um, um, and I've I certainly worked. <laughs> well, I've worked in a company before where there were several where that was the case. You know, you get the the. The lovely words and, and the photo shoot opportunities and, and the taglines and the quotes, but then at the coal face every day, that's not reality. It's very different, and that makes me angry as well. So I don't know. Do people need to be shaken up? Do they need to be made angry, or do we just comply and remain complicit? It's a really hard path to walk. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know. <laughs> um, Perhaps I need to get angry again. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, so, so for me, there's two, uh, two, three, maybe three bits there. Um, the, I, I, I definitely think that <clears throat> that that there is a lot of um, noise in business um, about <clears throat> um, being co uh, culturally appropriate. So, you know, let's put up our pride flags for multinational companies, but let's not put them on social media channels for Middle East or China. Yeah. So, uh, okay, so, so you're standing for this thing, but you're not standing for it where it's needed the most. Yeah. You know, Just Stop Oil protesters aren't protesting in China and India. Okay, well, why is that? Well, maybe because it's easier to protest in Germany and the UK, <laughs> or, yeah. or you know, stopping middle class people going to the desert um, for burning. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely think that there is um, some saviorism going on. You know, look how virtuous we are um, because we're standing up for this cause. Um, look at all the good stuff that we're doing. Uh, not necessarily actually achieving anything other than saying that you're supporting something um you know I, i've seen some organizations do some quite interesting stuff some quite good stuff uh, without necessarily jumping up and down saying that we're doing good stuff um you know I, i'm supporting some nhs organizations at the moment in neurodiversity and neuro inclusion but they're very very quiet about it because they're like well this is just how it should be you know, I was talking to somebody yesterday and, and she was like, so neurodiversity, where does that sit? You know, is that a HR thing? And I was like, well, if you were talking about how tall people are, where would that sit? It, it, it shouldn't be a HR thing. It should be a whole company thing or not a thing at all. And we should just 
put up with um or you know accept it um you know i, I was listening to um etif from uh, diversity and ability on the podcast talking about um disablement and accommodations and normalizing those accommodations if you're hard of sight you put on glasses and societally we don't care if you're wearing glasses okay so why can't we get to a place where societally we don't care if you're using assistive tech we don't care that you're in a wheelchair we don't care that all of this other stuff is there to help you exist to the best you can be um but there's so much stigma and um stereotype associated with labels and support aids that we haven't got past um so for me i think there's a conversation about normalizing this stuff rather than jumping up and down about it um morgan freeman uh, was asked how to stop racism he said stop referring to me as a black man and i'll stop referring to you as a white man and then we won't have the division because we haven't created an us and them we, we're just talking um and that th there's a there's part of the neurodiversity movement that um wants to move away from neurodivergent neurotypical. um and i can understand why because we want to remove the otheringness of difference but how do you stand for the rights and privileges of those marginalized by their difference if you don't give them a collective now <laughs> yeah how, how do you identify these people as different so that you can put things in place to support them? um yeah that's an interesting conversation and debate it is it, and it's it's a very emotive one isn't it people feel very strongly about the terms and terminologies and person first and, um well per person used... first until you upset somebody because you're using the language the person wanted you to use um but that language might not actually be grammatically correct but yeah. let's... <laughs> it's person yeah. first until somebody else gets upset. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is complex. Um, I, I gave up entirely on Facebook. Um, I found LinkedIn to be a really good place to meet interesting people like yourself. And I found a lot of support and fantastic sources of information. I never thought I'd find that on LinkedIn. It's been very strange. It has its issues. Um, <laughs> so all platforms. <laughs> yeah, uh, but boy, it was Facebook. Uh, the the indie groups on Facebook were a toxic mire of oh my goodness, attack, attack, attack. So um, yeah, I, I walked away from those quite happily. Um, and LinkedIn has yeah, I've met some really interesting people. Um, I I I think I'm, I'm trying to choose my words carefully because this is going on the internet. Um, I don't want to be attacked. Um, <laughs> um, I, I, I'm unsure where I sit with affirming. I think that there's some benefit of believing somebody's lived experience and perception of reality, but that doesn't mean that believing their perception is actual factual reality i could look out of the window and say the sky's pink because i think the sky's pink or i'm colorblind and i can't see blue and it is actually pink how real is that and should somebody be affirming the fact that i see the world different especially if they're trying to help me um yeah there's lots and lots of conversation about aff yeah, affirming care in counseling and psychology um yeah I, 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 yeah I'm, I'm torn on that i i, I yeah I, i'm trying not to trip myself up <laughs> um, but yeah it's it's a bit of a minefield to say well yeah, how is the best way to support these things 
because actually from the diagnostic the medicalized pathologized model of difference we've only had these terms for 100 years but we've had this biology for a million years so how how and why do we treat people support people the way that we do now compared to how we used to you know um my wife's just bringing me a cup of tea excuse me ooh. thank you the privilege is that a wood stove that you got in the back corner as well it is, yes, a little wood stove. It actually makes the whole place boiling hot. So it's, it's, it's really cold enough for me to light it, unfortunately. Yeah, no, I, 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 I completely get you. I, I, I've always wanted a cabin in the woods. Um, mm. Yeah, I, 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 I grew up uh, between Cambridge and Newmarket um, on two acres. So, you know, we had an orchard, we built tree houses. Um, I used to go to Scotland on holiday, um, you know, in the woods by the lake. Um, yeah, and now I live with a postage stamp back up, so I don't, I don't have that luxury. Um, but yeah, I've been watching a couple of um, like outdoorsy YouTubers with their mini cube um, stoves, and it's amazing how small something can be to make a, you know, two meter by three meter shed very hot. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, you know, a little rocket stove or you know, an ammo tin converted into like a camp stove um, is actually really, really um, hot. Mm -hmm. um, I do like um, my bushcraft YouTube forays as well. No, they're always that is kind of um, uh, backseat it, sort of. Well, you can experience it without all the discomfort and mosquitoes. Well, well, <laughs> well, I, I, I think there's a you know vicarious living going on uh, with Simon the bloke in the woods who's also Suffolk based um, and is yeah he's really good I like him yeah um, yeah I, I, I've been watching avidly uh, 4x Overland so um, Andrew is was born in the UK um, but uh, travelled frequently in Africa um, then went to live in South Africa um, then came back to the UK for a bit and is now in Australia. So he does overland travel. He's got a Toyota Land Cruiser and he drives around really remote places doing all kinds of really cool stuff. So I'd love to do that, but I've got four teenagers and cats, so I can't. Now, maybe when the teenagers get bigger and I can leave them at home and they can babysit the cats, well, then maybe. But, you know, when I was 16, I was like, I'm going to get a Defender 110 double cab pickup with a removable camper, and I'm going to travel the world because there's no point in having a fast car because you're just going to lose your license. So you might as well have a car that can do the speed limit anyway. Um, and yeah, now old Land Rovers are thirty or forty grand. <laughs> it's like, how did that happen? Um, um, the the Ineos Grenadier looks like an awesome car, but is now fifty to seventy by the time you've done anything with it, um, and it doesn't really have a deal in it. Well. Um, so yeah, I'm quite happy with my five-year-old Ford Galaxy. <laughs> it does fifty to the gallon and is a shed, so I can put whatever I need in it. Um, but you know, I, I I used to go camping quite a lot with the Scouts, so you know I'm chairman of the local Scout group. So you know, two or three times a year, getting onto campus, um, it, it's nice to get back to nature. Yeah. Um, yeah. Tomorrow night we've got our quiz, our first quiz since COVID because we had a fire and lost 25 grand's worth of camping equipment. Um, mm. So we've got some money from insurance, but everything's stupidly expensive. Um, luckily, the insurance were like, well, to, you know, they give us the list price of replacing stuff. And they basically gave us the list price, except for our storage container, um, which we need to basically find three grand to cover the difference, because shipping containers have gone through the roof in the last five years. So... Bit of a faff. Anyway, w w um, my my ADHD has just chased a white rabbit through um, <laughs> you know, wood burners, outdoorsiness, <laughs> um, and the I fact that we're both wearing Berghaus jumpers. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <good. Yeah. laughs> um, 
so um i don't know if you can hear workmen in the background um, our next no. neighbors um decided that um the plastic guttering isn't good enough so they're having aluminium guttering on top but we're a semi-detached house so um i don't know how that's going to work connecting to my pvc um mm. and yeah you, you, I, I just heard a drill earlier i heard hammering but hopefully it's not going to be too bad um so um a, a, a personal question you can tell me to sod off um Do you think it was sleep that helped deal with your chronic illnesses? Or do you think it was the stress of doing 10, 12 hour days with all the movement and commuting and stuff? No, that's, that's a reasonable question. I think it was it was a combination. I don't think it was one thing. Um, the commute, uh, taking that away meant suddenly I, I had time to, to just keep up with the usual domestic things that we all have to do, which before I had to try and fit in after the 12 hour day. Um, not being in a really sensory overstimulating environment all day really, really helped. Um, and then the sleep just came because I was coming home and I was so jacked. I, I was, you know, anxious and stressed and I couldn't sleep. Um, I was, chugging coffee because i hadn't slept so i was you know my caffeine intake was enormous uh, i literally would get shakes sometimes I, I would drink so much coffee i can't drink coffee anymore i just i think i have just overdone the coffee um so i think it was the collection and, and, and then that just led to being out of sleep and we need sleep to recover and, and rest and particularly heal if if we have i mean i spent my life um anxious you know with well, I'm so hyper vigilant. Uh, I was so hyper vigilant. It still kicks in sometimes, and, that, and that's just an, a huge strain to, on, on the body to be in that state. And that's what I was like every day at work. Um, and it was just simpler I, because there was less social interaction required. So I didn't have to go through. Well, how am I going to deal with small talk? What do I talk about? Um, uh, or I might, I mean, I'd literally, I'd, I would take longer routes around the office because I knew it would be quieter and I wouldn't have to talk to somebody. <laughs> um, I know that I dislike talking to people, but it, it is that small talk thing. What do you talk about? Um, because it's, I, I did some time working in Sweden. Um, they've got a fantastic term. I can't remember what it is in Swedish. And I'll sort of butcher the pronunciation, but it, it translates to dead talk. That's that's what small talk is referred to and uh, it was a similar culture in norway i loved working in sweden in norway um, it can take a long time to build a business relationship or working relationship with people but then it's genuine you know it's not like you suddenly turn up there and they're your best friends you like, no they're not they'll be a bit reserved they'll be a bit suspicious and i think it's okay <laughs> that's good and no small talk if you want to talk to people, yeah, you no dead talk. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no dead talk. Yeah. And yeah, fine. There's a flip side. You'll get the intimate details of someone's bowel surgery. But hey, at least it's real. Yeah. <laughs> if you ask someone how they are, um, I had a Danish colleague who would say, "Are you really interested, or is that an American? How are you? How are you?" Um, because she would tell me, <laughs> "No, I'm not. I'm having a terrible time. It's crap." Um, and here's why. Yeah. But I like that. That's real. That's that's genuine. Um, small talk doesn't float my boat, and I don't see the purpose. Um, I do on an intellectual level. There's, there's, there is a social purpose, isn't it? Um, but no, um, I don't know how you cope with. Is it something you're happy with? Small talk or? Um. Well, so so. I I, I think there's two pieces here. Um. So so the first. I don't want to lose track of is um, the meerkat and hypervigilance and how lived experience has taught me to be extrovert. Um, so I, I did some personality profiling. I talk about it in Tanya's episode um, where I'm massively introverted and massively extroverted. Um, and I've come to the realization that my extroversion is a learnt response 
to create a social space so that I have the ability to build rapport um, and build those relationships. But actually, that's not my default state. Um, so, um, yeah, small talks all right, big talks better. Um, but but you need you need the psychological safety to talk about stuff. Um, yeah, but you also need the emotional reserves <laughs> to. To, to, to manage big conversations um, I, I was scrolling on social media the other day and Timu have put adverts in front of my face every fourth post um, and one of them is my social battery and it's a little pin badge uh, with um, green to red smiley faces on, and you get to move the pin up and down the smiley faces depending on how much you want to interact with people and I'm like that's kind of cool but um, I don't know how I feel about paying China like one pound sixty to send that from the other side of the world. Maybe that's yeah. not the most ethical. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but start talking about just off oil. Maybe you shouldn't be buying really cheap shit on the other side of the world. Um, yeah, yeah. maybe if somebody in Suffolk wanted to, you know, laser engrave or three D print me something, then maybe. But let's not um, pollute the planet more than we need to. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'm all right in social interactions. Um, if anything, I think that's one of the strengths that I have um, is the ability just to strike up a conversation and talk about stuff. Um, and, and with that comes a level of oh, the need for psychological safety is overcome easier because many of the people I speak with, I have a commonality with. And because my brain is a sponge, I've got all of these nodes of information and I, I could always, nearly always, find a tenuous link <laughs> between where they are and something I know. Um, so we can have a decent conversation about stuff. Um, you know, um, the kids hate playing word association with me because sometimes I just come up with a, something that appears totally random. But in my brain, the connection sticks. Um, yeah, it's, it's all a little bit mad. Um, so, so the conversation for me around hypervigilance, do you, do you think that that is a learnt response because of the difficulties neurodivergent folk, or you personally, um, experienced developing your understanding of the world? Um, or do you think it's just something innate that, you know, there are some people that are just more switched on to risk or maybe a bit of this hmm. it's an interesting question i uh, an another thing i started which has really helped uh, and it was fortuitously just before lockdown uh, was therapy um i was very anti-therapy uh, i'm from a working class background therapies for middle class naval gazers it's all very self-obsessed i don't need it you just work on through you pull yourself up by your bootstraps um, so, and I was really encouraged by a, a colleague to give it a try. Um, and it again has been a profound experience. It has really, really very hard. It's not, not an easy path, not if you're serious about it, but it has had a profoundly positive effect. And, and part of that is acknowledging lots of trauma when I was a child and one of the consequences of trauma as a child is hypervigilance um, it's a protective mechanism you know if you grow up in a traumatic environment it's a survival uh, mechanism but i don't know if part of that was already there um i don't know if a lot of the trauma i experienced was because of or at least made worse because i was autistic um I, I even don't know. I, I have begun to come to question, am I autistic at all? Or am I a sensitive person who's traumatized as a child? That's a complex post-traumatic stress disorder. Yeah. Um, I, think, I don't think I am. I think I am autistic. But again, I, I don't know. And the crossover 
but it is big. You know, if you yeah. the Venn diagram of the two, it's a massive overlap. But I, I think my physical sensitivities are significant, um, and they're hard to explain. And the way I think, it was interesting. You were talking about connections between things, so that's how I think. I I don't do time. Time has no meaning to, for me at all. I can't remember years that something happened. It's all connections between things. Um, and they're very vivid, my memories, um, and they involve all my senses. Um, and they can be triggered by a really silly thing, by a connection, by something. Um, I love uh, prehistory, so I, I walk around the fields with my dog and there's a flint scraper, but that, that will trigger a memory, and before you know it, I'm off onto the development of the Spitfire, which is where everything always ends up in my head. I don't want a Spitfire. That's where we're going to end up. It's a bit like the Kevin Bacon thing. How long will it take me to get back to the Spitfire? Um, so in short, I, I really, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, but it's there. It's still there. It's worse when I'm tired. It's worse when I'm stressed. Um, we're taking my son on his first foreign holiday in October half term. And so it'll be an airport. The location we're going to was entirely dictated on where we could get to from a small regional airport, <laughs> not a big one. So we we just we're going to the cost of something in Spain. It wouldn't have been our first choice, but we get to fly from a small airport. We'll be the only plane leaving. Um, but I know now that as soon as I go into that environment, I will be switched on to everything that's going on, I'll be tracking everybody's movements, um, and it's going to be tiring. Hey, that's that's if I can manage that a bit better, now. and I'm not in that environment every day, which is where I was before when I was in the workplace. I've forgotten what your question is now. Sorry, Richard. That's, that's, that's a perfectly um, helpful, reasonable, um, insightful conversation. So get to where we get to, and then I'm like, I'm a fan of Mitchell's work also. <laughs> um, now, now what, what are your um, um, views and opinions on um, the Douglas DC three Dakota? <laughs> because um, as 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 cargo planes go, it's a pretty good looking plane. Unmatched, I think personally. There you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We were at uh, took my son for his first um, trip to Duxford recently yep. over the summer, which was a lovely day. I think he enjoyed it. I had a wonderful time. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm I'm um about ten miles north of Duxford, um off the M11. Um so um yeah, I have the sound of Merlins over my house every day. Um, and yeah, while uh marshals at Cambridge were um more avidly looking after the Hercules program than we'd have Hercules on test flights as well. So um yeah, now the UK's retired the Herc um and now Marshals are only servicing, I think it's Norway and Denmark's, uh, because they've opened a site in Canada for the USAF um, oh, and Canadian Air Forces. Um, so, uh, Fat Albert, the Blue Angels C 130, was repainted in Cambridge. Um, so, that was quite cool. Um, and I just happened to know the guy who ran the Hercules program until two years ago. Um, he was like, here's some more pictures that you haven't seen online. I was like, Jack, <laughs> um, yeah, and he's um, yeah in the Royal Air Force um, over at Cosford now doing um, oh, training more people in how to be engineers. Cool. Um, but yeah, really interesting guy. Living my life vicariously because that's the job that I was going to have. Um, you know, w when I was 15, 16, I was in the air training corps. Um, I was going to go to Cambridge to study aerospace engineering um, and and yeah um, traits and behaviours got in the way <laughs> um, so yeah I got expelled six weeks before the end of my first year mm -hmm. um, so that was a massive kick um, and then I went back and did A-levels met my now wife uh, failed all my A-levels and had a kid so um, yeah and there I am looking at this guy who's what, 10 years older than me um, as wing commander CEO of number one technical school of the Royal Air Force and I'm like that's that's the job that I wanted 20 years ago um, yeah. 
so yeah, it's Justin's a lovely guy, but um, it, it it pains me every time that we speak. <laughs> like that's what I wanted. Um, you know that 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 jealous kid session where you're like, well, I've got my own toys to play with, but your toys are better. Um, but yeah, it's a, a wonderful place to be. Um, yeah, and then I'm doing this stuff, um, which is talking to fabulous people to understand what's going on in their lives and how their difference has impacted. Um, and you know, I, I I think that we're quite lucky that so many of us have found gainful employment or at least purpose purposeful work. Um, when you look at the widest statistics, you know, yeah. half of people in jail have ADHD traits. Okay. Well, um, I said in an interview a couple of months ago that my wife probably stopped me going to jail. You know, I, 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 we all do foolish things as children, um, but some of us do slightly more foolish things than others. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there, there's no quicker way to grow up than get a kid. Um, and it doesn't matter if you're 20 or 40. Um, all of a sudden, your life's turned upside down and you you learn what adulting actually is um, because you don't have all of the disposable income and time to do what you want to do with your life. You've got something else to think and care about. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Dealing with change whilst also being neurodivergent. That's hilarious. Yeah. Um, so, so, you know, nobody else in my family has a diagnosis. Um, and I've tried to keep it that way because there's a lot of stigma attached to a lot of the diagnoses. Um, but my wife last night was like, I'm too hyperactive. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't. At like 10 o'clock. And I'm like, I, I can't believe yeah. she, she calls me slurs all the time. And I'm like, just, we tend to attract each other, you know, us, us different folk. We um, do. So, you know, the fact that you know, she, she, she was trying to blame it on her cherry Coke. It's like, you, you drink cherry Coke like five times a week. So the fact that you had a bottle of cherry Coke at eight o'clock does not mean that you're hyperactive bouncing off the walls at 2 11. It just, that's, it doesn't work like that because you had cherry Coke yesterday as well and you weren't hyper yesterday. Um, or as hyper anyway. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it's very interesting raising geeks as children, uh, you know, my kids don't necessarily aren't aren't as outdoorsy as I was, but that's because I grew up in a time when you know, computers made awful noises when connected to the internet and ran at fifty six k if we were lucky. <laughs> um, so it was easier to go for a bike ride and see somebody than you know there was no video calling, um, and yeah, now they're playing computer games fourteen hours a day unless they're at school. Yeah. Um, but you know that that means that they've also got a community that they don't need to leave the house to see. So during COVID, I think they managed quite well because yeah, you know, their friend group was also online. Um, you know, I think if COVID had hit in the eighties, um, it might have been a much harder conversation for kids. Yeah. Um, and I don't think they would have locked all of these businesses down because these businesses kind of needed to happen in offices um but anyway um i've just realized that we've been talking over an hour already um so is there anything that you want to talk about today that we haven't touched on um and if not then i'll pick your brains on something um just trying to think oh, but, oh, but, oh, but. There was, it's gone now though, there, there was a point I wanted to make around, ah, yeah, um, company um, inclusion efforts or particular yep. recruitment. Um, one thing that has often frustrated me about those was was that, gen, well, certainly in many cases that I've experienced, they don't involve us in, in actually setting them up or or defining what the aim is or 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 even coming up with um changes that that will help Um, there was the example i gave where we had a very direct involvement from a senior manager and and 
who ask. That was unique. I, I have never encountered that um, again or we, or prior to that. I, I've encountered um, cases where we've been told well, what is good for us. We will be doing this. Yeah. Um, there was one particular example where it was it was a change to um, the criteria that we use to assess people each year in, in their annual assessments, which the managers believed would improve inclusivity. You had to actually give examples of where you had uh, been inclusive. Um, and we tried to point out, well, many of us socially struggle to, to actually interact with other people. So we may not even get that chance to be inclusive. Many of us, can our behaviours can be misinterpreted uh, as being exclusive or rude or insensitive. So you, your move here to try and support and increase inclusivity excludes us and that potentially puts us at a disadvantage. Um, but they wouldn't change. Um, so what we ended up doing was actually producing um, some guidance for our some neurodivergent community on how to gain the system. Well, this is what you need to do. You need to provide evidence that you've done these inclusive things. Try and do it like this. Try and keep records. Try and do that. So it's to try and mitigate the, the very actions that were supposed to help us. So we really need to be involved. And, and there is a paternalistic, I think you mentioned that as well, kind of attitude. Where, and, and almost a kind of pitying, you know, you know we're doing this, aren't we great? Are you poor little neurodivergent people, we can tell you what it is you you need. You all know you, we can't involve you. you, you don't know, do you? Which again leads to back to anger. <laughs> yeah. So that, that was one point, yeah. So um, I, I remember doing a piece of work on behavioral frameworks um, and, and one year, uh, the organization tied your behavioral score to your bonus. So simply, you know, your bonus pot was 20% of your salary. Um, and if you hit your um, like targets, uh, you would get up to that 20%. So if you didn't hit your targets, then you wouldn't get the full 20%. But one year, they split that to 15 and 5, and 5% 5 of your bonus was scored on a behavioral framework where essentially different grades of the organization had um, a different target number. So I think there was something like 60 metrics. It felt like 60. It might have only been 25, but it felt like 60. <laughs> Broken into like four or five like themed groups based on the values of the organization. Um, and essentially um, a zero... Uh, was a negative behavior. Um, a one is a behavior that we expect everybody to achieve. A two is what we expect line managers to achieve. And a three is director level. So essentially, you end up with a score of, you know, if you get threes on everything, then as a director, you'd get your full bonus. If you score two on everything, um, as a manager, you'd get your 5% and et cetera. Um, so it was possible for somebody in a lower grade to score a three, which would help them bump their scores, um, but it would also penalize those at the higher end of the organization from actually not fulfilling the traits and behaviors that they might, should exhibit as somebody in that role. Um, and I, I was going through, and one of the like, one, like score one or score twos, um, was like um um don't react impulsively and i'm like <laughs> i just I, I don't even think it was don't i think it was never and i was like just i've got a problem with this <laughs> why do you have a problem with this well because maybe i can't do that <laughs> so as a middle manager it was like well i can't I can't get my full bonus because you've written a thing that I can't score a two on. <laughs> so then, you know, um, that started my conversation about behavioral standards 
um, and whether or not we should be holding everybody to the same standard, or should we have tiered standard based on role and responsibility, or should we just have a minimum base standard and then just let people sort it out? Um, and I think that's kind of where we see organizations innovate, but then also get into the news for bad culture. Um, you know, we, we did some work with a multinational tech firm whose contract basically said, you're allowed to do whatever you need to do to fulfill your role and responsibility. Okay. So then people broke the law. And I was like, well, my contract says I can. <laughs> your contract doesn't say you can. Your contract is ambiguous on that fact. <laughs> but then you then end up in the news because there's a toxic misogynist culture or you know racial con uh, culture because you're treating people poorly because you think that's going to get you to where you want to be based on your roles and responsibilities so changing those roles and responsibilities to do that inclusively then changes how people interact with each other but then what what is inclusive yeah you know, there's so many words in the edi world that have double meanings or well, 13 um, so, you know, if inclusion is creating a psychologically safe space for people to talk about stuff, no matter their difference, well, then we can do that. If inclusion is you don't have a brown person in this conversation, or you don't have a neurodivergent person in this conversation, well, then isn't that being exclusionary in a way? You know, if you've got a team of five, and you need a woman and a non-white person and a neurodivergent person, well, then those three people might not be three of the best five people that you need for that conversation. And that's without doubling up and looking at intersectionality and stuff. Um, so, you know, there's, there's lots of argument at the moment about um, mediocrity versus meritocracy. And are we actually... Um, allowing people who aren't the best for the role get the role because of their difference. Um, and that's an interesting debate that as white men, we're probably not allowed to have. <laughs> no, no let's, let's be honest. There's going to be roles that we've got because we are white men. Um, uh, so yeah, it's it's a tough one, isn't it? It's really hard to know what to do. I mean, we, we know what to do. We need to make the playing field level at a really early age, but then that's a complete societal change, isn't it? Because it is structurally unfair, <laughs> incredibly, in so many ways. Um, so I think we have to um, support people um, who have been marginalised and, and give them a shot. Um, Again, that, that brings so many problems as well and, and potential hurdles. And so it's not, I don't think anyone's saying it's easy. <laughs> oh, I, I, I listened to a, um, uh, Mike deGrasse Tyson, um, no, Neil, Neil deGrasse Tyson on a, um, a, a podcast the other day talking about, um, difference. Um, and, and he said, well, what we need to do is change the rules that we govern ourselves by. Um, so, you know, the, 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 there's no point arguing about what's right or wrong when the rules of the game are broken. So why don't we change the rules of the game? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. it can be a fairer game. Um, and a lot of the difference, or, or, or a lot of the way that we manage, manage is probably the wrong word, deal with difference is the best way that we we think we can but it might not be the best way but we don't know what the best way is because we've never had the time or experience or situation to try something different mm. um, you know if we had <clears throat> um, you know university challenge but teams were rated on um I don't know, cognitive dissidence, um, 
and you could then make a league of university challenge a bit like the paralympics where you've got handicaps and grouped people so you've got fair competition at different stages so everybody can participate because they're given their own um you know um competitive classification um but that doesn't mean that the people who are the best at the thing don't then remove the opportunity from somebody less able and you can all compete in your own way you just have to find a class to a classification to fit in i'm using classification rather than class because class is the abbreviation of classification and class has more than one meaning and that's not helpful um but you know that there are so many things in the world where we segregate things potentially unhelpfully <laughs> um and and that means that some people who are extraordinarily good at something dominate the field because we haven't created an inclusive way of allowing that competition um yeah anyway i'm gonna get off my soapbox for a second um so 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 my my, my closing thought of this conversation goes back to um your conversation on um being considerate and careful about what arguments you put forward and how you put them forward. Um, your touch on um, therapy and how that all relates into the anger piece. So do you think that the management of that strong emotion has been easier because you're now in a work-life balance that is less stressful you're not in a situation that is constantly putting you in high alert so therefore you're less stressed therefore less needing to defend yourself and therefore less angry or is a bit of that but actually you're doing lots and lots and lots of work to reduce and remove frustration and the other feelings that lead into anger yeah this is you've described this exactly that is both um i'm not as hyper vigilant i'm not stressed and anxious i'm not as exhausted and sick um, um and i've done a lot of work in therapy to work out what i'm really angry about uh, and to understand um it's it's taken well, it's not take it's helped me understand where the source of some of that anger. It's also helped me understand that I think some of it is justified. Um, um I was <laughs> I guess not not unusually for someone who's a childhood trauma. I was and I still am in many respects incredibly emotionally repressed. And again, I don't know how much of this is is the the autism and how much this is um, I never know how to pronounce this. Is it alexithymia? Alexa, I, I don't. Um, that one. Uh, tr <laughs> yeah. Trouble uh, recognizing your own emotions because I certainly have that. Um, something that many people would find emotionally very triggering and would have a strong emotional response can happen to me, and I will literally feel nothing emotional. Um, and I even struggle to to know what an emotion is sometimes um i i may know that i'm stressed or anxious or worried because of a physical um I, because i shake slightly or i feel nauseous so i i, I a lot of my therapy work is trying to understand well, what what does an emotion feel like what should i feel i don't know um so it's, it's a really complex mix um so if I do feel them, it tends to be it's very loud. So it's lots of anger, um, lots of sadness. Um, some, something, you know, we're up to 11 on the yeah, yeah. spinal tap scale. Um, more subtle uh, and ambivalent kind of situations is, is really hard. And it may take me a long time to actually realise that actually, no, I, I didn't like that. That may be sad or, or a bit angry or a bit upset um so it, it's it's complex 
uh, in some respects, I kind of wish I hadn't learned about um, complex post-traumatic stress disorder because it's really muddied the whole water for me. I mean, because we thought, oh, it's autism. It got a bit more complex with Alexa, um, with uh, dyslexia and dyspraxia. But uh, to learn that, well, okay, we, we're not just sort of immune to what happens around us and to acknowledge that lots of bad stuff happened when I was a kid. Because um, I don't know how it, it, you, you kind of, well, it was a lot worse for other people. Yeah, it wasn't that bad. It could have been worse. Well, so uh, part of me thinks um, that deep, deep feeling and emotions is a reserve of the privileged. And those people who struggle daily don't have the time and bandwidth to worry about the little bits, you know. The, the difference between you know the five different feelings of sad. It's like, well, I just feel sad. I don't have time yeah. to worry about which one of these little bits I'm actually feeling because um, it, it's inconsequential in the grandest schemes. And actually, for me, only dealing with stuff when it's 11 means that I'm not spending any of my you know, cognitive or emotional bandwidth looking at the smaller stuff. Um, yeah, you know, I, I remember a Kit Kat advert in the 2000s um, that was, don't sweat the small stuff, it's all the small stuff. Take a break, have a Kit Kat. Um, and I was like, well, it is all the small stuff. Um, and actually, it's only the big stuff that I need to worry about because if it's big enough for me to worry about it, then I really need to worry about it. But if it's not big enough for me to worry about it, then it's probably inconsequential. So what's the point in worrying? Uh, but also coming to the realization that nobody's coming to save you. Yes. Um, so, so, you know, if if I'm adrift in a boat and I'm starving, <laughs> only person who can fix this is me. <laughs> so am I going to worry about where my next meal is coming from? Or am I just going to be happy that it will come? Um, not that I've been on a boat stranded and hungry and therefore the analogy falls apart because actually you would be slightly worried about where your next food is coming from. Um, but, you know, I, lots of people have had it worse than me. You know, I, I, I was quite privileged to grow up in, um, you know, somewhat of a middle-class village in a detached house with its own garden by my grandparents. Um who afforded me the care I needed to mature. Um, and they gave me a better life than I would have had with my parents. So, yeah, a, a lot of the work that I did in the last 10 years um, is kind of looking for silver linings. You know, th th there's nearly always a benefit. Now, the benefit may not outweigh the harm, but there's nearly always a benefit. So, Go go and find the benefit and be happy that there's been a benefit. Um, and that doesn't stop you standing up for the harm, but at least you can have some rationalization or um, what other word am I looking for? Relief that something good came from it. You know, me being given up by my parents, pretty bad. Me being afforded the opportunity to get to a decent school, a formal grammar school, um, you know, travel the country with cadets. Um, I wouldn't have had all of those opportunities. You know, go on skiing, skiing trips with school, um, you know, visit Venice. Yeah, you know, I wouldn't have done any of that if I'd been with my parents. Um, so there is a benefit. Um but yeah, it might take me the rest of my life to come to terms with the fact that the benefit might not outweigh the harm. <laughs> um, so yeah, a, a lot of the work that I've also done is looking at um, how emotions develop. So I, I'm quite an analytical guy. I, I like to understand the why behind things. Um, 
so you know looking at polyvagal theory and how our limbic system deal with trauma and stress <clears throat> and how uh, perceptions and thoughts and feelings and emotions tie into all of that is quite interesting um so for me anger is a secondary emotion yeah anger has to be triggered by another feeling you you don't just feel angry you feel angry because you're depressed you're frustrated you're sad you're something um and the problem is when when you wait for it to get to 11 you don't know what's causing the anger so all you're feeling is anger um so trying to make a space to understand the why behind the anger my hope is one day i'll get there and i'm recording on my desk why are you needing a screwdriver you need an allen key as well she needs an allen key as well um, she's decided to take her chair apart because she doesn't want it anymore so um I do love it when um, we have conversations about building, maintaining, and respecting boundaries. <laughs> and I'm not going to get angry about it. I'm just frustrated. <laughs> I'm just saddened that um, you know somebody's impulsive nature, because she definitely doesn't have it. No. Um, just just she leads to cherry coke again. Random outbursts and needs for support, um, and yeah. Then she'll go and break my drill and then be upset at me because I'm trying to help her because of, anyway, that's not. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, for me, there's a big question in that mix about um, whether or not it's healthy to give time and space to the smaller things. Because when we can then look at the smaller things, then we can deal with them while they're small and it won't get to it. Um, but I don't know how you can when your world's on fire. Mm. You know? um, I, I, I described it to one of my counsellors a couple of years ago of um, kind of like range, range anxiety. You know you need to go on a journey, but your fuel tank's on red. But you don't know how long the journey is, and you don't know where the next fuel station is. So you, you're constantly under this stress and tension of, I don't know what I'm going to do. I need to do something because something's going to go bad. <laughs> and when you've constantly got that um, challenge of managing the reality, personally, I don't think that I've got enough capacity to then look much wider than that. Because I've got this constant stress. Um, and part of me relates to your experience of, well, actually, when COVID happened and working from home became the norm, actually, we've all of a sudden got all of this time back because we're not sitting in a car or sitting on a train, um, you know, listening to podcasts or music or staring out of the window aimlessly. And you know, catching up on emails, thinking about the meetings that we've got during the day. Um, we've got some time back, and you know, luckily, before COVID, my my office is twenty minutes away, so was, so yeah, it was it was an hour a day for commuting, and actually that was just enough to be able to break the the cycle of home and work. Um, but then I started working from home. And started doing the afternoon school runs. And that means that at 10 past four, quarter past four, when I'm back from the afternoon school run, my brain's off for the day. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you do the morning school run, that's your commute. You do the afternoon school run, that's your commute. Oh, work? <laughs> no, I'll finish that because I've done, I've commuted home already. So actually, you know, working, you know, four, five, six o'clock in the afternoon was then really hard because it was rewiring the brain to say, well, just because you've gone into that self-reflective space of being on your own in a car for half an hour doesn't mean that you're finished work. <laughs> anyway, I've just talked at you for like 20 minutes. Really? Um, 
so in closing, um, any other thoughts, questions, queries, um, topics of discussion? Mm. Or, or, no, or, I'll, be, I'll be closing because we're <laughs> an hour and 40 in. <laughs> um, I am like you. I do the after uh, the school run. Uh, my Another weird thing that happened to me during um, lockdown was I used to be kind of a nightish person. I'd be up quite late. Gradually, I, over lockdown and working from home, I actually realised I'm a morning person. I get up ridiculously early, about half past four. Um, I love it. It's a quiet time of day. I get loads done. And so I can kind of do the school run and come home and knock off or maybe do a meeting or something because I've put my hours on in, in the morning. I'm not suggesting you try it. It's not for everyone. It's a big word for me. No, no, nothing really. It's been a really nice chat. Thank you. I've really enjoyed it. Good. Um, yeah, the, the the purpose of these is to um, help me understand other people's lived experiences because I don't want to listen to some stuffy professor talk about neuroscience and why we are the way we are and mm. then argue about the science because the science isn't settled. Um, and actually listening to how other people have um, struggled and or thrived um, helps me understand difference better because I'm, I'm I'm listening to a lived experience rather than the theory behind it although both is helpful um and then i thought well yeah if it's useful to me it's probably useful to some other people so why don't i record them and put them on the internet so charlie's went out this week um and we've had a handful of views which is more than i would normally get um and, and and some feedback um you know charlie sent me a message went oh i don't know how often you get feedback but somebody's just sent me this and i was like well that's really nice nobody's given feedback to me before um but you know j just opening the door to uh, for, for, for people to listen to what other people have gone through achieved um I think it's got some value. I don't know how much value, but, oh, yeah, for, but for, for the four people who watch, um, some value. <laughs> These things take time to build momentum. But your point on struggle or, or thrive is an interesting one because I definitely struggled severely. My whole life was a struggle. And I, I'm, part of the anger is it didn't have to be like that. Yeah. Um, but the last maybe five years, I'm, I'm beginning to thrive. Um, but it, it was a hard, hard journey, um, which, yeah, uh, will be the same for many other people in our positions as well. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much for coming on. Pleasure, Richard. Thank you.